This is BBC Two. Now, Newsnight. No deal, no summit. And it's Star Wars that still stands between them. Good evening. It's almost like that meeting in Reykjavik just a year ago. The superpowers have taken us tantalisingly close to a major arms control deal and then failed to clinch it. And the widely expected Thanksgiving summit this year is not on, at least for the moment. America's Secretary of State told the world this evening that Mr Gorbachev wasn't yet satisfied in the area of space and defence. Soviet commentator Joe Adamov gives us the blunt message that without movement on Star Wars there won't be a summit. Richard Pearl, Mr Reagan's Assistant Defence Secretary till this year, says this is a dangerous Soviet tactic. At the end of a week that's seen the Big Bang take the big crash, a calming influence tonight with a cut in British bank interest rates and trade figures better than expected. But Wall Street is still sombre about the future. We have a special report from America on how the money men are looking to Capitol Hill for long-term solutions. And Lester Piggott, a legend in his own time, starts a three-year jail sentence for cheating the taxman of nearly two million pounds. And a full roundup of today's news from home and abroad. President Reagan tonight says he remains hopeful of a summit, even though the Soviet leader, in an unexpected move tonight, has now made it clear that the meeting isn't on until there's progress on Star Wars, Mr. Reagan's strategic defense initiative. It's a remarkable twist in the wildly unpredictable relationship between the two sides as they fence their way towards what could still one day be a spectacular arms control agreement. But tonight, even the expected deal on INF, intermediate range nuclear forces in Europe, is held up by disagreement over the fine print of verification. However, in his talks with America's George Shultz, Mr. Gorbachev had two new ideas. First, a concession. He'll suspend the building of the new controversial radar station at Krasnoyarsk for a year. The Americans say it flouts the anti-ballistic missile treaty. And second, and this is being taken as more of a ploy, he's offered a moratorium on the deployment of any more missiles in Europe. The mood in Moscow this morning appeared to be all confidence, with both sides apparently heading for an inevitable INF agreement and a Thanksgiving summit in America. Mr. Gorbachev even said he thought his visit to the States would happen. But by the time George Shultz, the American Secretary of State, faced the press this afternoon, the optimism had withered. The summit was off, for the moment at least. Mr. Gorbachev, as it emerged, is apparently not yet satisfied, particularly in the area of space and defense, that uh, the state of things is such that he is comfortable in visiting Washington. Now, we have not set any date for Mr. Gorbachev's visit, although he assured us that he wishes to come and holds open the possibility of coming this year. Mr. Schultz's disappointment was clear. For despite the progress that both sides agree has been made on intermediate weapons and should be possible on strategic missiles, the Russians' determination to link progress there to restrictions on space weapons was as clear as President Reagan's continuing commitment to their development. The President will not, and none of his advisors have anything but full support for him in this. He will not give up the ability of the United States to pursue the research necessary and for that matter be prepared if the research pans out to move ahead with defending ourselves against ballistic missiles. This is a matter of importance to our security. The Soviet Foreign Minister Edward Shevardnadze was as anxious tonight as the Americans to stress that the Moscow meeting had produced concrete results. But the fact remains that apart from a letter Mr. Gorbachev is sending to President Reagan, Mr. Schultz could give no clear indication of the way forward, not even the prospect of another meeting with his Soviet counterpart. 
I don't uh, think there's anything in particular uh, to meet about right away. And I suppose the next thing that we will do is keep checking the mailman and see if he brings a letter. And we'll look at the letter, see what it contains, and then move ahead on that basis. So, once again, the diplomats are rewriting diaries in which they'd confidently penciled in a summit conference in America next month. And they've been forced to ask themselves the question, is Mr. Gorbachev now so fundamentally opposed to Star Wars that he will set aside the tantalizing prospect of a whole range of rewarding arms control agreements until the Americans abandon SDI? Tonight should have been the point of liftoff for a process of nuclear arms reduction in which the two superpowers promised to astonish the world. And one glimpse of the headlines of the deal they seem so close to is enough to appreciate its scope. First, INF. Today, the two sides have intermediate range nuclear forces in Europe, with on the American side around 350 warheads on the cruise and Pershing missiles, and the Russians have about 1,500 warheads on their SS 20s and other shorter range missiles. An INF treaty would reduce both these stockpiles to zero, the first ever real cut in nuclear arsenals. But the real breakthrough that seemed within reach is on long-range strategic nuclear weapons. The subject of the parallel strategic arms reduction talks start for short. And here, the two sides were again in principle agreed that the present Soviet total of 11,000 strategic warheads and the American total of 14,000 warheads would be reduced to just 6,000 each, a cut of more or less half that would slash Russian warheads by 5,000 and America's by 8,000. The arms race would be historically curtailed. When our prospects of this dream being quickly realized have been dashed, and the hitch, once again, is Russia's fundamental objection to President Reagan's four-year-old challenge. I am directing a comprehensive and intensive effort to define a long-term research and development program to begin to achieve our ultimate goal of eliminating the threat posed by strategic nuclear missiles. Mr. Reagan's conviction that the world would be safer with Star Wars runs in direct counterpoint to Soviet fears that the reverse is the case. Well, it seems to me, first of all, that, uh, that we are now clear understanding what the SDI will be. We are not sure that it will be an offensive weapon, but perhaps during the, some research work or experimentations, there was, there was a possibility that perhaps a new exotic uh, weapons will be invented, which, be, which will be more offensive than defensive. That is why it seems to me we need a clear understanding what will be the uh, SDI, what, uh, what the SDI will be, and after that, it seems to me we must decide what to do. And so Star Wars, Mr. Reagan's strategic defense initiative, has dogged the superpower arms control process ever since Mr. Gorbachev took power. And he's played it for all it's been worth, sometimes playing it up, sometimes down. When Geneva negotiations resumed in March two years ago, the Russians quickly linked any progress on intermediate nuclear force reductions with American concessions on Star Wars. But come November, the two were unlinked in all the warmth of the fireside summit in Geneva. INF could now be pursued independently. Until, that is, Reykjavik, when Mr. Gorbachev told Mr. Reagan the two were linked again. For just four months, till February this year, when, in an apparent bid to give the INF talks a brisk shove towards a treaty, Mr. Gorbachev again unlinked them from progress on SDI. And now, finally tonight, the linkage is back again. Not explicitly on INF, but on the summit at which an INF treaty would be signed. Tonight's reimposition by Mr. Gorbachev of his veto on anything that will carry Star Wars beyond the research stage will leave the world in little doubt about the fundamental Soviet fears of what space defense could do to upset the strategic balance. But it does pose a serious dilemma for Mr. Gorbachev. Does he now abandon hope of a major arms deal with Mr. Reagan and look to a new president to negotiate away Star Wars? Or does he do the best deal he can with Mr. Reagan and hope that future presidents will allow Star Wars to wither away? The gap between the two sides is deep on the issue of Star Wars deployment. The Russians say it should be delayed for 10 years. 
the Americans say either side should be free to deploy after seven years. But even more fundamentally, the Russians would allow only research during that period. The Americans would insist on development and testing of Star Wars as well. The main difference between the US and the Soviets on SDI today is the future of the ABM Treaty. That is a treaty which bans defenses. The Soviets want to continue that treaty. The Americans want, after five, ten years, to deploy defenses. So the question is, in the absence of an agreement on that fundamental question, the future of defenses, whether or not you can find a way for the next three or four years to gain enough confidence in what the other side's doing for both sides to agree to limits on offensive forces. So what are both sides up to? First, I spoke to the Russians and I put it to Joe Adamov, a leading commentator in Moscow, whose fault was today's failure. Well, I don't consider it a failure. I think uh, some advance has been made. I think both sides are more or less satisfied because a step has been made forward. The sides have come closer. And I think with time, we will be signing the INF Treaty and I hope the treaty on the, the cutback of strategic arms. But um, as Mr. Schultz <clears throat> clearly went to Moscow, hoping that you would tonight be announcing that there'd be a summit, that you had an INF Treaty in the bag and that we could look forward now to perhaps other massive arms breakthroughs in the next few months. No one would want this more than we, Peter, I assure you. Uh, you see, the INF Treaty, I suppose the biggest stumbling block is verification. We were always accused of not wanting on-the-spot inspection. We want all-round inspection of the places where uh, the INFs are produced, the ranges where they're tested, where they're deployed. We want verification of their destruction, of the stockpiling of the warheads to see what's going to be done with them. In other words, we want an all-round verification connected with it. Uh, judging by what has been written by military experts previous to this meeting, it seems that the American side did not want this all-round verification, which we insisted on. So, so there is a... Right, so yes. there, is a, there is a clearly a, a, a hitch on verification of the INF Treaty, which, uh, which right. is still holding matters up. But let's talk about the more broad problem, about what you seem to be saying about the summit and Star Wars. Are you, yes. now, are you now saying to Mr. Reagan, look, never mind the detail on verification INF, we must sort that out, but we will not have a summit with you until we have concessions on Star Wars. Is that right? We don't want any concessions. What we want is our partners across the Atlantic to stick to the anti-ballistic missile treaty for at least 10 years because we believe that SDI is not only a shield but a sword. Any military man on both sides of the ocean knows that it can, through um, weapons in space, weapons in space can strike at objects on the ground, on the surface of the ocean and in the air. In other words, it is not only a uh, shield but it, it is a sword and if we're going to limit strategic arms on the comparatively small area of our planet earth what uh, the americans want is to continue actually the arms race in this enormous unlimited space uh, outside of the earth in other words the unlimited vastness of space we don't want that the, the problem is not new the issue is not new what you're saying is not new what is new is that we thought that you would go to a summit to sign an INF treaty, when, of course, you have the detail and verification resolved, right. without solving STI. Now you but, seem to be saying, I'm sorry, that's not the position. Yes, you see, but if you read Mr. Gorbachev's speeches of late, you will see that he has constantly said that these two things are very closely connected, you see. I think we have made enough concessions in the past. We have unpacked the package of Reykjavik, we've taken out the INF and the shorter range missiles. We have agreed to scrap the missiles in Asia. We have agreed to close our eyes to the uh, so-called deterrence of Great Britain and France. You see, we really want the world to be safe. And it cannot be safe if you're going to go on with, uh, with the SDI. All right, well, I... let me tell you what the White House is saying tonight. They're saying tonight uh, that Mr. Reagan is not going to make the SDI a bargaining chip, and Mr. Gorbachev knows that. So is that that? You see, if Mr. Reagan does not want to stop his SDI from going ahead, in my personal opinion, that means he does not want a true stop to the arms race. 
He does not want to uh, stop the arms race from developing into space. It'll not be the development of a shield. It'll be the continuation on a much grander scale of the arms race in space. If that's what he wants, I don't think the people of the world will support it. Well, let me finally put to you what one uh, leading diplomat here in London said to me tonight. Uh, he said that this is absolutely typical Soviet brinkmanship. They'll change their minds in a few weeks' time. We'll have a summit before Christmas. I don't think we'll change our minds because we, we know what an arms race in space entails. And I'm sure your military specialists know it too, Peter. Well, Richard Pearl, Mr. Schultz was reluctant uh, to say that there seems to be a change of position by the Russians here. But is that you think what's happened? The Russians have simply hardened up their stand? I think this is typical of the way in which the Soviets bargain and negotiate, particularly in the closing stages of what has been a long negotiation. Uh, they may well believe that by uh, raising expectations about the prospects for a summit meeting and then uh, drawing back from uh, the setting of a date, uh, they can bring additional pressure to bear on the United States and achieve concessions in areas where they've been unable to do so thus far. So I wouldn't be too troubled by this. So people have been wrong to believe that Mr. Gorbachev badly wants a summit and progress quickly. I think he does want a summit. I think he does want uh, progress. I think this is a tactic for uh, achieving the kind of progress he wants on his terms. Now, a mm -hmm. fair tactic, one that will bring fruit in the end, just a matter of weeks, or a dangerous tactic? It's a dangerous tactic. Uh, I, sh I should not think that the administration will alter its position on key points of principle uh, under the sort of pressure that uh, Gorbachev is attempting to mobilize. So how serious, in very broad terms, do you think, how serious a blow is this to superpower relations and the prospect that many of us thought we had in the immediate future of seeing a, a real breakthrough? I think we will see an INF agreement. Uh, I believe this is tactical uh, when it is demonstrated that uh, the American position on crucial issues is not going to be changed by this sort of tactic, uh, we will see the summit go forward uh, pretty much as planned. But your judgment is that the Americans, in response to this tactical playing tough by the Russians, the Americans will play it pretty tough too. I would think so. Without having been in Moscow, it's hard to know what issues uh, brought this about, but I rather suspect it is uh, continuing pressure by the Soviet side to get the United States to abandon its research program on strategic defense, and this president will not do that. Do you not accept the essential Soviet, the thrust of the Soviet position, which is that you cannot expect to get a, an offensive weapons agreement while you sit there with your, with your research and development and testing program for a defensive uh, program in space that would make our uh, reducing offensive capability increasingly useless? Well, let's be clear about uh, what the two sides are doing. The Soviets have a program very similar to our own. Uh, they actually began their program before we did. They have invested more in it than we have. And while we announced a, a program of strategic defense in 1983, uh, the Soviets have never announced. Uh, they've only grudgingly acknowledged that they have such a program. Now, unless you can deal with strategic uh, defenses by limiting them in a manner that both sides agree and that can be verified by both sides, you run the very considerable risk that the Soviet program will continue while we will abandon ours. In an open and democratic society, if you sign a treaty uh, undertaking to abandon research on strategic uh, forces, you're compelled to do that. You can't have a covert uh, research program on the side. But the Soviets, of course, uh, are free to do that and have done so uh, in the past. So but once they start seriously to develop and test and certainly to deploy systems, you will immediately know that they're moving in that direction. Well, in, indeed, uh, there is controversy now about uh, Soviet deployments uh, some of which are in violation of the existing ABM treaty. There's a radar at uh, Krasnoyarsk. There's no doubt that there's a radar there. It's uh, the size of four football fields. But there's a dispute over what it means, uh, even though it uh, clearly is illegally positioned. Uh, there are questions about what other defensive forces might tie into uh, that radar and the other radars in a network that the Soviets have built over the years. Things are never black and white in this business. And even the things you can observe are open to uh, different interpretations and we are talking about something very sensitive in the overall balance because if the Soviets were uh, to achieve a defensive capability covertly uh, uh, together with the formidable offense that they would keep even under 50 percent reductions you would have a situation in which the Western alliance would be open to intimidation and that we wish to avoid. So as far as you're concerned you're not worried you don't mind the fact that this that this this is now left the immediate grasp of the negotiators. No, I don't mind, and it's uh, always the case in dealing with the Soviets that uh, if one is prepared to be patient, you get a better result than if you jump at the first thing that comes along.
All that you've said, however, notwithstanding, do you recognize that you do now have a new Soviet Union to deal with in the time when you first took office yourself and President Reagan took office, uh, and that there is here, uh, in spite of this tactical end game that may be going on at the moment, a chance of a real breakthrough in superpower relations? Well, I hope so, but uh, while there are changes taking place in the Soviet Union, and uh, Mr. Gorbachev is trying to uh, improve the desperately uh, uh, failing Soviet economy, we have not yet seen any decline in the Soviet defense budget. Uh, the missiles and aircraft and howitzers continue to come off the assembly lines at the rate that we saw before Gorbachev. They continue to intervene in places around the world, fomenting instability wherever they can. So in its international dimension, we have yet to see a, a significant change in Soviet policy. So what do you say to those who suggest to President Reagan and people in the administration that one needs to help forward the reform process in Russia by making perhaps more concessions to the Soviets in arms control and other negotiations than one would have made five or six years ago? I say they're wrong. Uh, if what we want to do is uh, achieve changes in Soviet international policy, which is after all our first concern, together with human rights, uh, then I think we ought not to pave the way for them to avoid difficult choices. There are those who believe that the Soviets are driven internationally by a failing economy, by shortages of hard currency and uh, scientific and technical resources. Uh, if that's true, uh, then bailing them out of their economic and scientific and technical problems will enable them to continue very high levels of military investment without making uh, needed reforms. And I'd much rather encourage the reforms uh, by letting them make the kinds of choices we in democratic countries always have to make between defense budgets on the one hand and, uh, and social budgets on the other. Right. Now, at the end of it all tonight, where are we? Have we now lost the prospect, do you think, of anything much more than an INF treaty in the time of President Reagan? Well, I think an INF treaty, together with some other less important uh, agreements, some would say marginal agreements, uh, is all that was ever in prospect for a summit uh, this year. The differences on how to compose 50% reductions and on the treatment of strategic defenses uh, are too great to be surmounted in the short period of time before the end of the year. And it's important in these matters not to rush. It's difficult enough to do it right when you have all the time uh, you need. And it's virtually impossible to get it right if you're working against an impossible deadline. Richard Pearl, till this year, President Reagan's Assistant Defense Secretary. Well, now from the world of arms control to the world of money. The week of the great crash ended with the stock exchanges on both sides of the Atlantic calmer, but looking forward without much confidence to the future. In London, better than expected trade figures brightened a gloomy morning. They showed the balance of payments for September only £55 million in the red, compared to £929 million the month before. The big banks cut their interest rates by half a percent down to 9.5% after the lead set by the Bank of England. But for all that, the FT100 index closed down 38 points at 1795.2, and the city found itself counting the cost of the most turbulent week in living memory. The market is 25% or so down compared with a week ago. Investor sentiment is extremely fragile. There's no confidence yet returned to the market. Um, and I think a lot of opinion forming will be done over the course of the weekend and uh, to ready for another firefighting operation early next week. When the London markets open again on Monday morning, their attention will once again be anxiously focused on Wall Street, which has dictated the pace on the world's markets all week. Today the situation there appeared to be stabilising, with the market refusing to be stampeded by losses in London and earlier in Tokyo. But there is no doubt that deep concern remains about the state of the American economy and about the political will in Washington to correct it, as Will Hutton now reports. Downtown Manhattan at 8am this morning. New York stockbrokers and investment bankers are assembling for the last day's trading in a week most believe they'd never see the week they're already calling the crash of 87. Volumes of shares traded on Wall Street have broken new records, and so have the daily swings in share prices, more violent than anyone could ever have dreamt. It's disconcerting, it's embarrassing to, to be uh, involved in these markets where there, it almost seems to be lunacy. Um, I thought at one time as a forecaster that uh, one could rely on certain things and that uh, we had the parameters uh, pretty well in place. A bad day in Wall Street used to be down 50 points on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Now, after uh, Black Monday or Blue Monday or whatever it was, down 500 is even possible. It was terrifying because the market was sending an extreme warning signal about 
the financial system and potentially the real economy. And that warning signal was so loud and so uh, overwhelming that if you show me someone who said on Monday night he wasn't worried, I'll show you a liar. When a stock market falls by 23% in a day, there are bound to be casualties as firms are left holding shares worth very much less than they paid for them. Already, some small brokerage houses have ceased trading, and some of the small specialist market makers have been taken over to bail them out of trouble. Hundreds of millions of dollars are rumored to have been lost by risk arbitrages and some of the corporate raiders. And there are rumors even around some of the biggest and most prestigious names in Wall Street. They might be in difficulty. Their share prices have more than halved. This is a financial system under stress. OK. Thank you. You're very welcome. Harvey Eisen is the 43-year-old president of last year's best-performing American Mutual Fund, in British terms, a unit trust. All week, his switchboards have been overwhelmed by phone calls from investors wanting to sell their units in his fund. And when they sell, Mr. Eisen has to sell in turn to raise the cash, like other mutual fund managers involuntarily adding to the panic. He agreed to be interviewed, but only with his phone lines open. Hello. I don't have to speak to her. You just tell her that we don't know, we, don't, we have not heard that rumor and there's no reason for us to believe that that's the case. There's nothing I can add to it. Okay. Sorry. What rumor is that? That the stock exchange is closing. The stock exchange is not to close. It is just to close early for three days to allow brokers to catch up with the backlog of paperwork. Mr. Eisen remains highly apprehensive. The people that I know that have been very successful in the business, that are considered to be the best in this business, are all either terrified, scared, um, confused, immobilized. There is not one person that I know, maybe one, but I don't think there is one that can rationally, in a lucid, calm way, explain what has happened because these investors have been taken by surprise. It's, it's a shock. To calm the markets, the American authorities have taken a series of measures. The Federal Reserve, America's central bank, has said it will supply cash to whoever needs it. Interest rates have been cut, and the New York Stock Exchange has requested that computerized trading be restricted. Automatic sale of shares by computers, it said, has made this week's gyrations much worse. I don't think humans sold, uh, sold the market like that. I think it was computer programs going on a rampage. Suddenly the the arithmetic all said, sell stocks no matter how much a human might like them, sell them, IBM, DEC. And, um, and fortunately, it seems as though the, uh, the exchanges are moving to, uh, to regulate that, to, to eliminate program uh, selling. So maybe that'll calm things down. There's another view. Computers alone don't cause 500-point falls in stock markets. All of the financial markets of the world are, are signaling a strong vote of no confidence in the, the, the approach which the key Western nations uh, are taking to managing our way through these uh, familiar but large problems of the U.S. budget deficit, the trade and, and balance of payments imbalances, the third world debt crisis, uh, the growing external debt of our country, and the like. All this week, pressure has grown on the president for action action to cut the U.S.'s budget deficit. It is the build-up of public debt over the Reagan presidency without accompanying investment, say Democrats and Republicans alike, that has weakened the American economy. Now the deficit must be cut. The president and the Congress must be willing to sit down together to work out a new real approach to the looming budget and trade deficits and the problem of rising interest rates. I've been saying in every speech I give that deficit is public enemy number one, two, and three, and I think now we can say it even with more uh, credibility. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Last night, at only his third press conference of the year, President Reagan tried to field the questions that had arisen all week. He has built his presidency around reducing taxes, but given the urgency of cutting the deficit, he signaled a change in direction. He is now prepared to negotiate a deficit reduction with Congress, 
and everything is on the table. This situation requires that all sides make a contribution to the process if it is to succeed and that a package be developed that keeps taxes and spending as low as possible. But would he really end his veto on tax increases? Mr. President, I've listened to what you've had to say tonight, and it is still not clear to me that you will accept and agree to a budget compromise package that contains higher taxes, will you? Sam, as I've told you, I can't discuss in advance what I will or won't do, but I'm going to tell you I have not changed my opinion about ever accepting a tax that will have a deleterious effect on the economy. And uh, most taxes increases do. Taxing is not the policy with re or the problem with the deficit. The deficit is due to too much spending. But congressional leaders today were optimistic that last night's conference really did open the way to a deal. A $23 billion package to reduce the deficit, combining spending cuts and tax increases. He's a reluctant convert to the possibility of some uh, additional uh, taxes. He doesn't really uh, like the music, as someone said recently, but he's learning how to dance. Uh, he is, I think, being put under tremendous pressure by his principal staff, by many of his friends, uh, by the circumstances of the market drop to do something, and the something he has to do is be more flexible. Despite all the talk, Washington has little to offer Wall Street, especially if the financial community are looking for really sizable cuts in the budget deficit. Last night, President Reagan said that last year's deficit closed out at $148 billion. But this year, the deficit is projected to go to $180 billion. So even if Congress and the President strike a deal, They'll have their work cut out to get the deficit back down. And some pessimists say that that prospect is now out of court. I think that the budget deficit is much more likely to be $200 billion next year than it is to be uh, uh, $155 billion or $144 billion or any other figure. I say that because, in my view, our economy is not sound. The other people say it's sound. I say it's not. I think we're more, much more likely to have a slower growth rather than a more rapid growth. Our economy is now in the fifth year of recovery. That's the longest peacetime recovery in the, in the history of our country. We've never had a recovery that long. Why have we had it? Because we've had enormous deficits that have stimulated the economy. When we slow down those deficits or try to slow them down, we're going to run into a recession. And the recession is going to, uh, go, going to mean more people unemployed and a deeper deficit. Wall Street today was calmer. The closing bell came two hours earlier than usual but it signaled a market that was unchanged on the day, even if down 296 points on the week. Mr. Reagan's performance last night seemed to have given some reassurance, but Wall Street insiders say they need emphatic leadership if the market is really to improve. We are at a fragile moment when confidence is, has to be the highest goal, restoration of confidence. And it's become clear that the financial markets and the financial system more broadly of the West, not just of the United States, uh, is looking for a sign that the U.S. budget situation will be finally brought under some control. It may not need a massive tax increase at all. Not, in fact, I would argue that a massive tax increase at this moment would be, in the, would be a mistake. But it needs a sign of control. Wall Street has other concerns, though, beside Mr. Reagan's economics. Computers that automatically give orders to sell shares at a set price added to this week's chaos. There are now calls for their use to be limited. And some of the financial instruments that were invented as Mr. Reagan relaxed the controls on Wall Street also made matters worse. Here, in the temple of free markets, talk of government control and regulation is no longer taboo. Uh, the political process does have to intervene in the marketplace. It does have to level the playing field. We have to sit down and agree what the rules are and, and who we're going to allow to enter and who we're not going to allow to enter. And if you just allow speculators en masse to, uh, to have uh, this kind of influence on markets that are extremely important to the capitalist economies, then you're asking for trouble. This week has left New York, and America for that matter, badly shaken. Widespread talk of recession may prove premature, and there's hope that the Federal Reserve's prompt action will avert any threat of a repeat of 1929. One fact, though, remains ineradicable. In a day, Wall Street fell 500 points. Americans no longer believe that markets are magic. 
and that may prove this week's most enduring testimony. Will Hutton reporting there from Washington, and in a couple of minutes, the rise and fall of Lester Piggott, but first, the rest of the day's news. The government has published a new bill today which will end legal protection for the closed shop. It would allow anyone disciplined for not belonging to a, a union to seek compensation. Under the bill, unions would not be able to discipline members who ignored a, a majority strike ballot and crossed picket lines. There'd be a new commissioner to protect union members' rights. And non-voting members of union executives would have to seek regular re-election. Trades Union Congress General Secretary Norman Willis said the changes were contemptuous of unions and an insult to democracy. But launching the bill, Employment Secretary Norman Fowler said it would give new rights to union members. I think that uh, there's nothing in this le legislation which uh, in any way weakens or strikes against the uh, democratic, uh, properly run trade union in this country. The Attorney General has denied any link between the British Security Services and the four men accused of conspiring to kidnap leading members of the African National Congress in London. Sir Patrick Mayhew told the Commons that the Director of Public Prosecutions had dropped the charges against the four men on the grounds of insufficient evidence. The inquiries that I have made have uh, established, uh, to the best of the information available to me, that there is no, since I am not an employer, I am not uh, uh, the employer of these people, any people connected with the security service. But I have told the House the information that has been provided to me that there was no connection between these persons or any of them and the security services. But opposition suspicions of a cover-up continue. Labour MPs are demanding an investigation into the government's handling of the affair and the alleged role in it of three senior Tories. They warned that the Attorney General's statement to the Commons today was by no means the end of the matter. But he was so careful and qualified everything by the limited amount of information he'd had and had to rely on others. And that's why I think the British public deserve to know from the only person answerable and the Prime Minister herself must come to the dispatch box. So this is not the end of the matter? I think it's only the beginning. Terrorists planted a £100 bomb inside the Royal Courts of Justice in Belfast today, but only the detonator exploded. Army bomb disposal experts spotted a second device nearby and blew it up, but it turned out to be a hoax. The body of an airman has been found tonight after a day-long search for the pilot of a Harrier jet which crashed into the sea off the southwest coast of Ireland. The body was found near Boscombe in Wiltshire. The jet took off from British Aerospace Centre at Surrey last night, but radio contact with the pilot was lost soon after. The threat of widespread industrial action by prison officers has receded tonight. The Prison Officers Association met today to discuss a ballot on national action in their dispute over manning levels. But tonight the Home Office has agreed to reopen talks with them on Monday. Three of the Liverpool soccer fans being held in Belgium on manslaughter charges arising from the high school.